context, how people use them, but they're always in they're always in our background. Well, and I I agree with you. Um, I grow a lot of herbs for myself, uh, you know, to use in my own cooking, but. I really grow herbs for the pollinators. And what I love about these herbs is they come back year after year. I don't have to really do anything to expect to see them in my garden. Now, I will tell you in the fall that I leave my herbs standing. That's on purpose. Um, there are things like my agastache, lavender hyssop, that self-seed and uh, they self seed everywhere. There's a good news and a bad news. The good news is, is I can share that plant with many other gardeners. And I had a um, hundred people come here this summer for a garden tour. And I was actually able to like give those plants straight out of the garden to the attendees, which they loved. But this time of year, it's not just the monarchs that are fueling for that migration, but many of the birds are also fueling. And those plants really add a lot of value to fattening those birds up as they get ready to go south. Have you found that true in your garden too? Yes, yes, I definitely have. Um, and the other thing, I just let my plants keep I keep them up because they also help build soil you know when they drop their leaves into the garden so I'm a more nonchalant gardener I've learned to be a more nonchalant gardener over the years and to take advantage whole advantage of of the plants but you are absolutely correct there's a lot of migrating birds you know as they pass through um, like this time of year is when I get on my hummingbirds which is really interesting and they seem to, and they love that plant too. They love anisys, and you'll see them hopping around on their voyage or their trip where they're going. Um, they'll stop by here and do a little nectaring and then, you know, leave. So it's part of those green corridors that we talk about, right. you know, across, across the nation. Every garden, I mean, everyone can have a garden, but not the same garden. And um, we all plant different things, but, you know, there's always somebody from nature that is interested in what we have in our gardens. Absolutely. And you do a great job of teaching people about these green corridors. And there may be people on this call who really are not familiar with that concept. Um, here in the Northeast, there's an initiative called Pollinator Pathways, but you talk about different resources that of people encouraging people to link gardens together. Can you tell people more about that concept and why it's so important? Well, because of sh shrinking um, bound property lines and we live in a world now that's increasingly um, high density buildings and homes and things like that. And so we really have to be more intentional about how we choose to neighbor with nature. And it's really important for people to remember that um, a yard always connects to something else. Um, you, it connects to your neighbor then to your neighborhood, and then to your community. And that really, your garden can make a lot of difference. So it's really important how you look around and understand your local ecology and things like that. So you can contribute, and then you might be able to neighbor with nature by neighboring with your neighbor. If they have something on their property, like a water source or certain trees or a field, you know, figuring out how, how to link those um, pieces of land together because the birds and the pollinators find ways to, you, you know, they definitely use that. And we know that we can make a difference. All the pollinator programs, like Green Bridges, your pollinator pathways. We know that we can do that in our own states, and then we know we can do it in our own communities and our own neighborhoods. But you have to start with your boots on the ground in your own backyard. Absolutely. And I think like even Elizabeth- No, no go ahead, sorry, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was I get saying, absolutely. <laughs> Um, even one, Liberty Hyde Bailey said, even one plant in a tin can be, can be a more meaningful garden than for somebody 
than a whole garden like I the huge gardens I have. It depends on the temperament of the person, but we can all make a difference, I think, in a one plant at a time. You know, it's just picking the right plants, like you with your milkweed. You've made a lot of difference, without a doubt. Uh, absolutely. And that's really what we want to encourage you, whether you have a big yard like Susan and I, or you just have a pot on your porch, you can make a huge difference. And you said something in your book, I highlighted and I'm going to read it back to you because I love this. Uh, we've reached the point where our plantings can no longer just be ornamental or edible. We need to explore ways to increase natural areas and enhance biological dis diversity by connecting neighborhood gardens, yards, and community green spaces. This will reduce habitat fragmentation and provide a safe place for movement of the plants and pollinators that help maintain healthy ecosystems. I mean, that is just boom in a nutshell. That is it. That's the like, you know, mantra that I think Susan and I are trying to convey here is that, you know, your birds, if you're a birder, lose half of their weight overnight. That's a lot. <laughs> and so if they've flown a hundred miles and landed in your backyard, is there something for them to eat? And I ran into this last summer. I was having a lunch outside with a friend in a commercial like district. And uh, this monarch butterfly came flying up and it kind of crashed into the window of the restaurant where we were sitting outside. And I scooped him up and tried to carry him sort of into the greenery, which were these perfectly manicured, no nectar bushes, you know, traditional landscape bushes. And I'm literally like walking around like, what am I going to do with this guy? Because it was a hot day. I could have put him in my car, I guess, and drove him home, but my car was 100 degrees. And I felt terrible for this butterfly because I couldn't help him. There was nothing for him to eat. We literally were in a food desert for him. So, so my, my encouragement to everyone here is really think about what can I do to be part of the solution. Here in Pennsylvania, we have 2 million acres of grass. Two million. And so if you could just take a small section of your lawn and convert it, you can become part of this green pathway that Susan has written about. That's good advice. And I, and I, I agree with it. Even planting in cities, I was visiting a friend in St. Joe, Michigan, and there were two houses in this very, um, old neighborhood but there were gardens and it was pretty wonderful but i looked at there were two houses right next to each other and one house had a whole row of milkweed planted on that side of the house and there were a few other native plants but the most outstanding one was milkweed but then the house right maybe not even 10 feet away next to it had um annual flowers like cosmos, spotelea, and things like that. And Heather, you would not believe how many monarchs were on that side of the garden. They had moved, I mean, they were using the milkweed, but then they had moved over to the neighbor next door. Right. Right. And it was a perfect, I was just so surprised and delighted and impressed by just a simple planning thing of sharing spaces. And these two neighbors did it perfectly. Yep, and I certainly is a very good point. I mean, if you're going to put in host plants, so for our monarchs, that's going to be the milkweed or the butterfly weed. And for swallowtails, that's going to typically be anything in that herb family like parsley, dill, fennel, carrot tops are a huge hit at my house and super easy. Anybody can do carrot tops. Um, so I think that what you want to think about is you need those host plants and you need a nectar source. And I get questions sometimes, they're like, well, I planted all this milkweed, but I don't have any butterflies at all. And when I ask them about their nectar sources, it's typically things like daylilies and irises, which really aren't providing a whole lot of food or nectar. You really need to think about those herbs, annuals, and native plants that are more that high value protein and um, nectar source. Do you have some, Susan, that you grow in your yard that you find that you a lot of your pollinators visit a lot? 
Well, I think um, it depends on the pollinator, but I have a lot of different pollinators. We just did this past weekend for our notable native herb committee. We did the fuzzy butts count and we were counting bumblebees. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. But, um, but everybody across the United States, because there's different units. So just to compare. Um, and so I had wasps on my mint. Um, the little flower flies like uh, cilantro, they seem to enjoy that. So there's a variety, but I'm going to confess something to you. I have an addiction for herbs and I, I buy seeds and plants and um, I'm kind of, I said, a nonchalant gardener. I I'm sometimes pick a plant, not because of, of its decorative. It's pretty to me, but I, I have a botanical interest in it just to see what it does. Right. Um, and even roll. Mary, um, little bees love that. So there's a whole combination. And that's the thing you want to get people to think about. Um, it's almost like gardening for habitat. Because, you know, as Aldo Leopold said, you know, we need to think of the land, the water, the flora, and the fauna. You think of the birds. Um, and I have a, a lot of um, animals around here, lots of birds. And it's really, you know, my herbs have, have really made a difference with that. But it's a whole community. And it, land is a community wherever you live at. And you can enhance it by planting. And one of the other things, if people are interested in native herbs, you can go, this is a resource. We decided um, about 10 years ago to pick a native herb um, and feature it on our website. Do a lot of research about the history, what pollinators like it, um, different ways that you can use it in your kitchen. Because the wonderful thing too about herbs is they're multitasking in and out of the garden. Agreed. They are a win situation for everybody. As you said, you like to cook with them. Right. I do too. And so they're just wonderful. This is um, wild bergamot that are fact sheet, but there's all different ones up on the website and you can, for the Herb Society of America. Herb Society of America. Yep. That's what I was just going to ask you. Um, and that's a dot org, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, great. I just uh, I so someone so. someone asked us if we could put the link. So for the folks that are here with us backstage, if you want to put in the comments, maybe you could share with us what you're seeing in your own yards. You are certainly citizen scientists and op observers of fuzzy butts like we are. Um, and I'm curious to what you see your pollinators visiting the very most. Um, from an herb standpoint, um, I can say my big win of the year um, has definitely been putting uh, carrot, and it's really a vegetable, but it's in that family, is putting my carrot tops in the garden. So last fall, I literally started soaking my carrots overnight, putting them in the garden. I let them go to flower. It's actually a really pretty flower, um, really super interesting. Even the underside of it is really quite interesting, but the swallowtails have used it all season. So it was one of the first things to flower in my garden and it is still flowering and I still have swallowtail caterpillars in my insectarium. So what I have done is insects like to fly over areas with grasses and flowers. So I have a, a tree, um, that, uh, you know, an alley essentially against a wall that the ground was terrible, Susan. It was just awful, hard to dig in horrible soil. So the first season, what I decided to do was feed the soil by overwintering clover. So I had that beautiful red clover. If you've ever grown that, it is stunning when it blooms. The whole area is lit up in scarlet and the bees are absolutely crazy about that clover. They are. They are. And that's so, an example of a multitasking herb. Puts nitrogen in the soil right. and feeds the uh, the the bees. It's great. Yep. You and can make tea out of it too. Sharon's saying she gets a lot of insects on her glow basil. And you know, I find letting those herbs go to flower, it certainly attracts them. The other ones that they love, and for a dual purpose, my cats do too, is cat mint and catnip. 
Um, so I, again, let these things go to seed. So if you have a cat and you're in central Pennsylvania, I have more catnip than I could ever supply my own cats, happy to share. But I've got a cat mint that's, that literally cascades over my vegetable garden wall. It's covered in blue flowers. It's one of the very first things to bloom when the beginning of the season, and it's one of the last things to bloom. So in the evenings, I literally have to kind of push the bees off to get to it, to give it to my cats, because the bees are just, they just flock to it. They love that herb. I grow calamintha, mm -hmm. and that it's a minty um, herb, and it looks a, somewhat like cat mint, but it's, in the bees are on it, it's it, mine's flowering right now, and um, there's a lot of bees and butterflies on it, and it has a lovely minty fragrance, and and it really survives in droughts. Absolutely, um, you've got several examples in the book of things that bloom this time of year that are high value for pollinators, like our goldenrods and asters. Can you talk about those? herbs or plants that you recommend for these fall fueling stations, really helping those migrants that are moving through that need these proteins and amino acids? What, what do you find to be very valuable? I, I really do find um, the goldenrod. I was out looking at um, not only in my garden, but for the fuzzy butts looking at the goldenrod and I have um, several different varieties, you know, some that start blooming early and then some that, um, you know, bloom later. They, they're, they were covering the goldenrod and a goldenrod plant is almost like a little village. When you look at it, it's not just the bees on it. There's spiders and different types of bugs, you know, assassin bugs. I mean, it's a whole, I mean, everybody gathers there to get ready for winter. Um, praying mantis like to lay their eggs. They go to them and then they'll lay their eggs on the stems. Right. You know, there's a uh, wasp. So there, that's a pretty amazing um, one. I'm trying to think, um, I was down by my prairie fan and we have blue fringe gentian blooming right now, which is a, a really pretty blue flower that blooms in the fall. And there was a bumblebee hidden in there. You know, he climbed right in. It was like a tubular flower. So I, it depends on what piece of prop, where I'm at on the property, but definitely herbs that are still blooming at this time of, of the year make a difference. Like you're talking about your carrot tops, something simple like that to do, you know, the basils, the mints are still blooming. Um, one of the plants I really like is clary sage. Um, it's a salvia biennial and it has really pretty pink um, flowers on it in the spring and birds like it and the bees love it. And then I let it go to seed and the goldfinches in the fall love that plant. So like there's so many plants, it's even hard to um, share okay. them all. I don't know what <laughs> I have to say about it. Yeah, I, this time of year, I, say, I would say that where I see my pollinators the most um, I have everything in my garden except the clary sage that you mentioned. I'll have to definitely look for that next year. Um, but right now, um, mountain mint covered, covered yeah. in wasps. Like usually I can go down there and I try to count as fast as I can just to see how many people are on there, but they're all buzzing about. But we'll have 30 or 40 different types of bees and insects on that plant at any one time. Um, the other one that I find they love is bone set. And um, oh, yeah. they are crazy about that. And it has a tendency to get pretty tall and flop. So I did do a two Chelsea chops on it this year. It's still flopping because we just had a rainstorm. I do my best, but you know, it <laughs> just sometimes doesn't work. The other trick that I did this year that you showed the bergamot, the wild bergamot in my garden has a tendency to get a little bit of um, powdery mildew. And so I really cut it hard this year. So I cut it very hard in the spring and I cut it one more time in the summer. And I had people on my page kind of questioning that. They're like, are you gonna get any flowers? Uh, the answer is yes. And for the first time it didn't flop. So highly, highly recommend if you're dealing with some of the issues related to powdery mildew, give them a hard, hard, 
a hard haircut, I find that the herbs for the most part really don't mind it. Um, so it really made a difference this year and it it's blooming at the right time because it's blooming late and my monarchs for whatever reason seems and tend to be coming later and later. Well, you made a really good point about knowing your garden, reading your landscape, knowing what's there, knowing when your plants bloom, um, and your, I call it phenology, you know, going through the seasons and seeing when different plants are going to bloom and stuff like that. But gardening is also experimenting, you know, discovering for yourself what, ha what works on your piece of property in your little environment. And you decided to experiment with that, you know, cutting it back and you had success. And I would encourage other gardeners in their home landscapes to take that same approach. And if um, one people sometimes worry about killing plants, well, if you're not killing plants, sometimes I say to people, maybe you're not growing enough because, you know, um, well, I can tell you that's very reassuring. Um, so I, I recently went to this Fabulous store. Um, I'm designing a garden for a, a client in North Carolina. So this amazing store in uh, North Carolina, uh, in the Garner area, where they actually grow the plants in gardens so you can see what they're going to look like which is super helpful. And for me, you know, I know what they're gonna look like, but most clients have no clue, right? And so if they're not gardeners, you know, his, his spouse really didn't know what we were looking at. She'd be like, oh, I like that. And I said, well, the beauty of what we're getting ready to do is you're gonna see things not in season. And you're going to get to see the leaf shape. You're going to get to see how big it gets. You're going to be able to see the color of the leaf. And so we're going to be able to add texture to your garden because she's got a lot of shade. And so, you know, I think uh, what they're saying is uh, we don't consider it hard to grow until we've killed it three times. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it just allows a gardener, it allows you to laugh and take a deep breath because sometimes I take these, you know, plants dying personally. <laughs> Like I should know better, you know, but, you know, trial and error is some of this for sure. I think what you're telling your um, clients too is I want you to grow along with this plant, you know, yeah. and discover it and see what it's going to do. Um, and you know what it's going to end up like, but it's fun. That's part of gardening is to watch something, to watch a plant or a tree come into itself. Um, just like a human being, so. <laughs> Absolutely, and Tanya shared that the pollinators went crazy for thistle in my yard. Well, I get that. It is a very high value in terms of protein and amino acids for your pollinators. Um, I am fighting Canadian thistle all of the time. I'm kind of like that crazy guy in that movie where he was trying to get rid of the groundhogs every way possible. I have tried to get rid of thistle every way possible. If anybody has a good idea, I have failed them all at this point. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, but I'm glad to see, yeah, I would definitely say the, the um, especially the finches love it. And um, I will, the other thing that grew well in my yard this year that was, I would say a high visited uh, flower is phlox. And I grew phlox in the sun, I grew phlox in the shade and it just, like took a licking and kept on ticking. So last year during pandemic, it was the only plant swap that we had in person. Uh, one of the museums did it here. And that's what I chose was this phlox. It was super hot the day we did that. So by the time I got it home, it looked half dead, but I planted it anyway and it grew. So if you're looking for a super hardy plant that the pollinators go crazy for, and if you'll cut the flowers once they're spent, it'll come back and flush for you again. Um, I've been super happy with that this year. It's been a great addition to the garden and it smells wonderful. So, um, and she says, it's oh, a nice plant, but I haven't grown that one. I mean, I do have some, but it's not one that I, um, it's beautiful, but I have to say my husband loves it. He thinks it's a very beautiful plant. It well, speaks I to him. I had a friend come over and her daughter had never seen my garden and um, literally while they were standing there, it was like a trifecta. We had a hummingbird, a monarch butterfly and a hummingbird moth within like two minutes. And I was like, 
could have timed that better because her, her daughter's like, oh my gosh, what's that? What's that? You know? So it, it's just, it's a great, uh, you know, low maintenance takes a lot of different conditions, but, um, it's everybody seems to like it. And I, and I'm like you, Susan, I like plants that can do multiple things for me, not just be like a one and done. I like things that bloom a long time and I call it kind of that symphony of blooms. I've always got something in my garden that's going because you want your pollinators to be able to eat and stay in your garden as long as humanly possible. So um, are there things that you grow like every year that you're like, this plant gets to stay. It's just, it's great. It does great in my garden. Well, I do um, herb wise, I grow all different types of basil every year. Um, I, I like cilantro because as I said, it's, um, it does a lot for, you know, the, the teeny, teeny pollinators. Yep. I have a lot of different lavenders um, yep. that I have planted that I, that I really enjoy. Um, right now I'm sort of getting into um, some of the herbal trees and shrubs. Um, putting those into my garden. But I would say I plant a lot of, as I said, basil, cilantro, a lot of the annual herbs, lavender, pycnanthemum, mountain mint like you. Yep. That's a great herb. Yep. Um, Monarda. Uh, yep. And then I just try different things. It almost is, it's which day you hit me and ask me the question. Sure. I'll tell you Absolutely. What, and I would agree with all the ones you said. They're all super easy and they're beautiful in the garden when they flower. The Monardas especially are, are quite striking when they bloom. Um, uh, I would say some of the other things that I've really enjoyed growing in the garden. I, like you, have a lavender hedge and I do that on purpose because the mosquitoes don't like it. So I find at that part of the garden, I don't get eaten by the mosquitoes. Otherwise, I'm usually pretty tasty to them. So um, that's one way that I have kept mosquitoes out of my garden is to have these smelly herbs that they don't really like it. Another one that I plant right outside my door that's good for your cats. It helps with upper respiratory um, issues. So they'll actually go and eat that plant, but it also keeps the mosquitoes away. And if you're a Thai uh, aficionado, lemongrass. I love growing lemongrass. It grows lemon fast grass, and it's super hardy. Like there were days this summer that it was just blistering hot and it would, just doesn't even care. So um, that's a fun one to grow as well. And uh, Tanya says she's got cardinal flower, blanket flowers still in bloom. That's a great plant. And I want to talk a little bit more about that one in the mint. She's got spearmint, peppermint, lemon balsam, mountain mint, and cat mint. We're coming to your house to have tea, Tanya. We could have <laughs> four or five different kinds of herbal teas there. Um, but I want to say a, a special shout out to Blanket Flower. Not only is it a gorgeous cut flower, it easily sells seeds, but it actually has a property if you've got issues with um, invasives. It actually prevents some of these invasives like garlic mustard from growing. So it's kind of an interesting um, the relationship that they have found. I mean, you talk a little bit about garlic mustard, which is a huge issue for me in my tiny forest in the spring. You know, you want to talk a little bit about allopathic and what that means and what it does. Well, it's they um, actually seem to put a chemical out into the soil and their root, their roots that turns. Um, other plants off. They're very invasive with their seeds too. Plus their their life cycle is so prolific. Garlic, mustard, you can get several um, crops, you might say, in, in one summer. But other plants, they don't like to grow around it. Um, but one thing I noticed this year, something happened with mine. It was coming and now it seems to have disappeared. It's starting to dissipate. Yeah. Um, but it is it is very invasive and it was actually brought here to this country as a salad herb. Yeah, you can eat it. <laughs> as, you, can, you can actually make pesto from it. If, right. If you I'm want have to give that a shot. Eat your enemies, uh, right? I, <laughs> so um but that is a truly invade, you know, a, a a perfect example of innovate invasive plant 
you know, because it's invasive on several different levels. Right. And I would say, you know, if you're dealing with garlic mustard, I mean, I definitely spend a lot of my spring pulling it as much as I can and piling it up so it can die. But I'm now going to make pesto out of it next time. Um, but the reward for doing that is that the natives moved back in. So in my little tiny forest, in the areas that I removed that multiflora rose, um, what I found was that um, all of the spring ephemerals, dog tooth lilies, uh, dog, uh, trout lilies, spring beauties um, came roaring back. And that is what the research certainly suggests is that by move, removing these uh, plants that have these chemicals that prevent other things from growing, the natives will fill back in. And uh, that's been my experience. So I encourage you not to get discouraged, just take a little section at a time and really try to go after it and get it out of there. I, I agree with that because it's not a very neighborly plant. It, no. it doesn't, um, you know how plant communities, native plant communities, um, they all, their purpose is to support one another. When one plant flourishes, the rest of the plants flourish and when and they step in and help each other out. But garlic mustard is a very <laughs> interesting, unfriendly sort of a plant. But yeah. there, mu there must have been a purple still. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and this is certainly a great, you know, segue into these exotic invasives. I mean, certainly this is the challenge. Um, sometimes by planting things that aren't native to our area, we're introducing issues that we can't even possibly comprehend. So uh, we were successful in the last month in getting uh, barberries banned in the state of Pennsylvania, um, which are highly invasive. And, um, you know, in my neighborhood, I'd say you'd be remiss to walk by a house that doesn't have at least one, except for mine, because I've ripped them all out. And I'm not telling you to go home and rip out your whole lawn. I don't think Susan or I would ever suggest that unless you have an unlimited amount of time and budget to do it. It's quite expensive. But what I will say is that as these things die out or as you have the funds and time to do it, definitely consider replacing part of your invasive landscapes like the barberries um, with something that is native. And I think what you'll find is it's a lot less maintenance on you. And in our case in Pennsylvania, we're number one in tick-borne diseases, Lyme disease um, specifically. And so I want that plant out of here because I don't want ticks in my yard. And so, um, you know, I don't use chemicals. I have a, um, a, a compromised cat and she's immune compromised. So we're, we cannot use any chemicals around her because we don't know what triggers her condition. But what I can say this summer is we've had one tick. That's it, which is incredible. But I, I do attribute that to I have removed some of these plants that no wildlife visits or eats and therefore are known to harbor ticks. So um, certainly if you have children or pets, um, you know, or you're outside a lot, I'd encourage you to try to get rid of the barberries. It sounds like you made a balanced habitat. You're working towards a balance between, you know, the, uh, the plants and how you live with your landscape, you have an environmental philosophy that you've developed. Right. Um, and it's really working for you, not right. only in your yard, but in your personal life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, certainly it's my goal to, you know, encourage people. Um, I feel like sometimes I attend webinars where they're like lecturing you, like you should rip out all of your yard. You know, you're going to kill everybody. That's not my message. <laughs> my message is to say to you that, you know, we want to do what we can to help to have more fuzzy butts in our yard. I love that term. I'm going to use that from now on, Susan. Um, but, you know, I am delighted to walk out in my yard and be able to hear the bees before I can see them. And I'm reading a really interesting book. I'm almost finished with it. And Susan, I'd be delighted to send it to you when I'm done. But a friend of mine gave it to my birth for, to me for my birthday. And this guy is a bumblebee expert from England. And his book is called A Sting in the Tail, T-A-L-E. Uh, so um, it's, uh, or T-A-I-L, like a bee tail. Um, but one of the things I learned in his book, which I absolutely love, and you talk about scent is the color of the night. 
And he talks about this research that has recently come out, which suggests that um, flowers fill the electrical charge of the bumblebees flying by them. And when they feel that electrical charge, they will release scent to attract them to come in, which I think is really cool. Yes, it is. I mean, when you start, the closer you look at Mother Nature and what she's doing in the flowers, it's just, you're just, you can't help but be delighted. Like the other day, I was, um, I asked some detoura in, um, I have a white garden that I plant um, right by my um, deck. Um, and I've got Nicotiana, um, and several different varieties. Um, and this detour that just came up, Moonflower. But the other morning, they were like bumblebees. I heard this buzzing and shaking. And I looked down in the flower, and here he was. And then I opened it up, and he just came right out. But he was in a good mood. Yeah, it, but they, it does. Yeah. I'd be interested in reading that book. Bumblebees are so special. Well, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of them. Um, I, I am a clinical researcher by day, and so I try to incorporate as much of that into my presentations and talks to encourage people that there's actually some science behind what we're telling you. Um, but what they're learning about bumblebees at some of the agricultural universities like uh, Clemson and Rutgers have both put out data that show that our bumblebees actually are the ones doing the heavy lifting. So if you like things like blueberries, and watermelon, think a bumblebee, because it actually does the majority of the pollination and seed setting um, versus a honeybee. And they've done clinical trials to show this where they're planting pollinator hedgerows, which is basically wildflower strips and native plants and herbs to attract the bees into these fields. And then they find by doing that, they're increasing the yield by up to 30%. That's not a small increase, it's a huge increase versus putting honeybee hives in those same fields. So um, it's a really great lesson for us as gardeners who also do vegetable or fruit gardening, that if you want more fruit and you want more vegetables, you wanna plant these herbs and native plants inside your vegetable garden for two reasons. One, more produce. And two, I find that by doing that, you have less pests that you have to deal with because it attracts the good guys and the good guys are gonna deal with the bad guys for you. What do you think? I agree with that. I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and this is a book I wanna share with your um, readers. If you, can you see it? I sure can. There's a little bit of a, uh, uh, there we go. Yep, so what's the title of that? Um, it's, it's called Native American Ethnobotany. It's by Daniel E. Mormon. He's yep. a um, professor at the University of Michigan. He spent uh, 25 years, 20 to 25 years writing this book. It's all on the different ways that Native Americans use native plants of different tribes. And in this book, he lists he, 4,029 plants. Wow. And then he goes on to demonstrate, this is, this is amazing you know, what plants can do over 44,000 different uses that Native Americans found for those 4,029 plants. Wow. And it, it just depends on the person's point of view or what they're looking for, where they live at, but it's just an amazing book. And if you want to learn some interesting tales about Native plants and uses, um, it's just, it's, it's really eye-opening to what a wonderful world we have and how native plants, they're kind of always in the background, but they really add to our, our, our local communities and um, our sense of place. So I would encourage people to look at this book. It's really fun. Oh, that's exciting. I will definitely do that. I um, read a, a similar book um, on, from John Forty. Uh, put out uh, the heirloom gardener this year and he has this beautiful chapter on yarrow and how he got interested in plants as a little boy as he fell 
and he skinned his knee and it was bleeding and the neighbor came over with yarrow and put it on the cut to stop it from bleeding. And that, you know, he never realized that these plants had other uses than just being a flower or just being an herb. And so I, I think it's so important to know these things that you actually have kind of a medicine cabinet in your yard uh, like jewelweed, for example, which grows in my shady moist area and the hummingbirds absolutely love this time of year, is a great plant if you think you've been exposed to poison ivy. And ironically, it grows in the same conditions or side by side. So, um, but I have actually given that plant when I know people have been exposed and myself, if I know I bumped it, I just immediately start rubbing that plant on there and then go in and scrub up good, but it keeps me from getting it. So, you know, it's important to know what these plants are capable of. I agree. This has been a fun conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I, the other thing I was going to say, um, so a lot of these native plants you can make tea out of. So a friend of mine and I went up to one of our native plant nurseries, which if you're in Pennsylvania, it's kind of near Allentown. And I think we have a um, someone who's dialed in from Allentown. So I highly recommend uh, stopping by Edge of the Woods Nursery. Uh, it's woman owned and uh, they're very super knowledgeable about, uh, about native plants. They actually have a really, really great content on their website if you're interested in learning more about plants. But I've bought a lot of things from them and their plants do great. But they had a native plant tea the other night. And so they took oh, things yeah. like goldenrod, monarda, um, I can't remember everything else that we drank that night. But it was so interesting. And actually goldenrod tea is awesome. So I am definitely going to make it. Um, so really, really fun. And I actually re, uh, reached out to some friends and said, Hey, I want to do this. I want to gather up some plants and make some teas. And would you come over and play with me just because I love tea and an excuse to get my girlfriends together. So, um, so, you know, I, it's fun, right? I mean, to be able to do these things that maybe you have never even thought of, but you can actually eat a lot of these things that maybe you're just using for cut flowers at the moment. That is, that is fun. And the different perspectives that people bring to gardens and the uses of herbs, that's why I, I love them so much because they really personalize the people-plant connection, as I said before, because we all have different interests. But a simple thing like a cup of tea that you can go outside and get, like I like to go out, one of my favorite plants for bees and pollinators is actually lemon balm. It's oh, a yeah. great herb. And Think it's some people don't like it they think it's invasive but it's also a very relaxing tea to drink like I'll go out and get a handful of lemon balm leaves and seep them in hot just seep them in some hot water and drink that tea and it's very calming something simple like that and to be able even to give a child something take them outside and pick some lemon balm and show them how to put that in a cup and pour hot water over it and just sit down and relax if they're stressed or overactive. You know, this is just a simple, and plants teach us. And so, yeah, I think the teas are, they're just, I just, I love them. Yeah. I drink chamomile, valerian, and hops. I make that tea for myself so I oh. can sleep at night. Oh, and it works great idea. very well. That's really cool. That's a great idea. And uh, Mason, who a friend of ours, again, from uh, Garden Cobb, thanks for being here, Mason, is saying uh, that he uh, finds that some people freeze sticks of Joe Pye weed. I have tons of Joe Pye weed in my garden, yet another hot, hot plant uh, this time of year. Mine's starting to fade at this point. It has bloomed for over a month and it is uh, very pretty pink and easy to grow, can take a lot of different conditions, but pollinator magnet for sure. But I'm trying to ask him uh, what are they using the jewel weed for? Maybe they're, they're I mean, excuse me, using the uh, Joe Pye weed for. So um, I am gonna lobby Susan that maybe we could change some of these pollinator plants to something other than weed. It seems like a lot of them have the word weed in it. And uh, you know, it's hard to convince people to plant weeds for pollinators, but it really does make a difference. But maybe if we called it monarch magic or you know, 
fuzzy butt <laughs> uh, blooms yes. instead of, uh, you know, uh, Joe Pieweed, uh, you'd be more interested in, in planting. But that actually is a very pretty plant. And it act in the story behind it is, I mean, all the herbs have really wonderful stories behind them. And if you actually look at a, a list of herbs in old herbals, there's so many listed there that you couldn't even put them all in a garden. Some of them aren't used as herbs anymore. They have switched over to be um, decorative garden flowers. Right. But they do all have a special story and they have potential. And that's our job to pass along that potential, you know, to tell their stories, demonstrate them and show other people like what you're doing in your yard. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm with you on this, that I'm still learning every day what some of these plants are capable of and that some of them have very symbiotic relationships to help each other grow. Um, one of our uh, GardenCom members wrote a great book that I highly recommend called Plant Partners. Um, Jessica Walliser is an expert at understanding the relationship between some of these plants and how they work together to grow better. And one that's really easy is tomatoes and basil. And those actually go together really well, but you get more tomatoes if you plant basil nearby. She, she, that book is great. And she's a very interesting person. I showed her the caterpillar of a black swallowtail that was on a rue plant when we were at one of the garden com meetings. Cool. She, she, she looked at it. She said, Susan, you photographed its bottom, not its face. Because <laughs> I thought I had the face. <laughs> She's an insect expert, too. <laughs> well, you know, maybe their butts are cute, like our fuzzy butt, but, but you know, uh, but bumblebees, you know, it's okay. <laughs> We're still learning. That's the one thing, but that's the one thing about gardening. You, you can never know everything about it. You're no. always learning. Yes. It doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been doing it, how young you are. There's always something new. But that was new for me. Yep. So uh, Mason is saying you can freeze uh, jewel weed sticks for poison ivy first aid in your freezer. Okay, you're going to have to tell me more about this, Mason, on our next call, because I'm totally going to do that, because I inevitably every year am running around this property without gloves, and sadly, I get poison ivy at least once, so um, I'd love to be able to have that available to me. That's a great idea. But yeah, Jessica is um, is an amazing person. Um, she and another one of our, our garden com people run a website called Savvy Gardening, which I highly recommend great, great tips. Um, and I find that a lot of the plant partners she's recommended um, are really easy to grow from seed, like basil, super easy to grow um, and does really great. The other one she recommended this year that I put in my garden that was a massive hit and is delicious to eat and as a tea is borage. And uh, the bees went berserko over the borage, but I put it in the vegetable garden to um, attract more pollinators, and it, it did work. I grow that, and it does. It's the other thing about that plant; it's really pretty, and you can freeze the flowers and ice cubes because they have like a cucumbery flavor, yes. and they add a real nice touch to iced tea. Yeah, it it was delicious for sure. And the other thing I made this year that was super easy, if you want to be a gourmet, uh, something they do at fancy restaurants and they probably charge you a few extra dollars, but you can look like a hero, is I made chive butter this year. And that was delicious. And it's really super easy. And it looks really pretty um, when it's all done because you got those pretty flowers in with the butter. So um, my husband was like, this is amazing, you know? And it was like, so easy it's such a you know you look like a gourmand and you really didn't work that hard <laughs> so i'm all for it um another one that i like again and a garden com member we're so lucky to have so many artists in our midst is eat your roses by denise Schreiber. Um, and she talks about all of the edible flowers that are in your garden and gives you recipes of how to prepare them um, and she's got a rose ice cream if you're an ice cream fan. But uh, she's really turned me on to nasturtiums. 
uh, nasturtiums are also brilliant in the garden. And um, I love them with cherry tomatoes because you get the spicy um, kind of peppery with the nasturtium. And then I just pop the cherry tomato right in the center and they usually don't make it out of the garden. So um, highly recommend that as well. Um, so uh, Jessica's book is called Plant Partners. If you're interested in um, growing a garden where you have herbs and other types of flowers in conjunction with your vegetables that will help reduce the amount of pests that you will get. So she recommends trap crops that will encourage your uh, eating insects to go to it like radishes and then protect things that might be a little more fragile. Um, so um, yeah, so yeah, so that's, that's that one. Um, and then I also will put uh, Denise's book in the, um, in the chat. So certainly um, we're coming to sort of a head here, Susan, and I am sure people are going to be super excited about neighboring with nature and you have a new book on herbs. If they want to get in touch with you or buy the book, what's the best way for them to reach you? Um, they can buy the book on Amazon, but you can visit my website, freshstartherbs.org. And it's fresh. Um, say that again. Freshstartherbs.org. Okay. I put that in the chat, freshstartherbs.org. I left the S off. Sorry. Let me try that one more time. <laughs> um, so definitely, um, Susan is a fantastic resource when it comes to herbs. And um, this is a very easy read. It's great for a beginner and it's excellent for someone like me who has years of experience. There's lots of little pearls to take away. And it's also beautifully done with lots of pretty pictures of what these plants look like um, and their value in terms of their hardiness, their bloom time, their native range. Um, so there's a lot of really useful information um, in this book. So I highly recommend it. And uh, certainly if you're interested in learning more about native gardening, um, I have a YouTube channel. It's um, called Garden Thoughtfully. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, we just completed a series on the monarch migration and how you can be part of the solution by uh, planting native plants and high value nectar sources. So I encourage you to take a look at that series if you haven't had a chance on my YouTube channel and subscribe because we put a lot of information there about native herbs and plants and we'd love to have you join us there too. So. Um, I'm super grateful to have you here. If anybody else has got questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, Susan, I'm having a request to put your book and name in the, um, in the uh, chat. So I will do that right now. But if anybody else has um, questions, you can ask us. But thank you so much for being here, Susan. I really appreciate it. And um, certainly we will have this up as well um, on my Facebook page and on YouTube, if you want to go back, or if you have a gardening friend that you'd like to invite to the webinar who may have missed it today, um, they'll be able to watch it there. And uh, Facebook is The Thoughtful Gardener. So thanks again, Susan. Thank you so much, Heather. I really appreciate your time, and I, I really enjoyed myself. It's my pleasure. You're welcome anytime, and you're getting a lot of uh, love in the chat here. Thank you guys for being here. We uh, appreciate your time, and uh, happy gardening. Take care. Yes. Happy fall. Yeah, absolutely. Bye now. Bye.